So what we're going to do now is we're going to switch gears a little bit, or a lot, and uh, I really enjoyed the morning session going from the theoretic to the application. Uh, but there are a lot of areas in ophthalmology that can be expanded and developed. And one in particular that I'm interested in has to do with color and color vision. I attended a meeting uh, for macular degeneration, and here it's in the macula. Most of the photoreceptor, I mean, uh, the, the photoreceptor cells are, are pigmented, they have their cones. And so I asked the question, well, why don't we look at color to monitor AMD? It's too hard, it's too difficult, it's, the techniques aren't there. So we have uh, some people in, in, at UCI that are experts in the area, and we've been working together on, uh, and to um, apply this knowledge of the color. And so the next speaker is Kimberly Jamison, who's at the Institute of Mathematical Behavioral Sciences, and she is the director for the Color Cognition Laboratory. And uh, she's going to be presenting on visual processing phenotypes in opsin genetics. Thanks for being here. I want to thank very much the organizers of this meeting uh, for inviting me to, to speak on my research here. Uh, I want to note before I start that um, this project actually uh, was initiated uh, about three years ago when I first met Chris Kenny at a bench to bedside meeting. And uh, she had invited me to give a talk on photopigment opsin genes, which I did uh, from a very psychophysical behavioral standpoint. But I'm sort of proud to say that after three years, we are able to say something that we think may generalize to a clinical setting. So today I'm here to tell you about um, two parts of what I do. One is uh, the behavioral assessment of color perception in individuals that have varying photopigment opsin genotypes. And the second thing is to talk to you a little bit about um, what we've done to try to think about how to generalize this to uh, clinical populations. And a good deal of this collaborative work has been done with Chris Kenny, uh, Andrew Brown, uh, Sherry Adelano, and other people in Gav Gavin Herbert, as well as people in my lab. So um, the hope today is to give you sort of an, an, a thumbnail sketch overview and survey some of the ways that we believe color perception can, can serve uh, in clinical settings. And to do that, I want to talk about, um, first, photopigment opsogenotype constraints on express retina phenotypes. I want to talk about um, some perceptual differences that are associated with opsin-dependent phenotype variation and have been psychophysically demonstrated in my lab and elsewhere. Two color vision assessment approaches that may be made appropriate with some tweaking for use in clinical settings and some preliminary findings that we now have uh, on AMD and normal control populations that show that patterns in photopigment opsin genetics are statistically associated with AMD disease. So um, changing gears, as Chris said, um, we're going to talk now about, uh, about the eye and about color perception in particular. And uh, color perception involves uh, the study of the retina. And in particular, I focus on the photoreceptors at the back of the globe of the eye and their DNA sequences. And uh, specifically, I focus on uh, cone DNA. There are people here in the audience who are experts on rod uh, DNA and rod morphology and biology, and that's not what I'm talking about today. What I'm talking about are normal trichromat <coughs> color vision model here. We know from, from uh, physiological and behavioral studies that a normal sta standard normal observer trichromat has three photoreceptive sy systems in their retina, an S cone, an M cone, and an L cone. And uh, these are what are required for what's called trichromatic vision. And genetically, they are inherited uh, by different mechanisms. And today, I'm going to talk in particular about the X chromosome inherited mechanisms. Um, X chromosome inherited mechanisms for uh, the L and the M cone in the back of the retina are the basis for um, retinal phenotype variation across individuals. So if you have a full complement of those three cones, you see a full color version of this picture of tulips. But if you lack a red cone, you, you see a picture like this or a scene like this. If you lack a blue cone, you see a scene like this. And if you lack a green cone, you see a scene like this. Um, these are all traceable to um, the human photopigment opsin genes. And in particular, um, they're traceable to specific single nucleotide polymorphisms that occur on the, on the genotype. And um, 
it's interesting to note that um, there's a whole lot of uh, variation in the human population with respect to how these different uh, photopigment variants get expressed in the retina, and it's entirely a function of the underlying genotype sequences that we can sequence and measure in the lab, and we've done that with uh, Chris Kinney and Sherry Adelano. Um, I show one example here, which is one SNP that's for a relatively common uh, substitution that occurs in the Caucasian population, where serine is substituted for alanine in the phenotype at one place in the 5,000 and odd base pair sequence, and this, um, this results in a spectral sensitivity shift that has been demonstrated to affect behavior. Um, so the L and the M opsin genes are very similar. They're very homologous. They only differ by 15 sites. There are seven sites where it's known that it affects uh, spectral sensitivity. Um, the chromophore gets activated by the quantum, quanta that comes in, and, uh, and these specific sites here in black are ones that are known to affect uh, dramatically the spectral sensitivity of what you will see in terms of the perception. Um, this is traceable uh, to specific positions in this, in this uh, sequence that I've outlined here. Um, these are the ones that affect the absorption of spectra of the pigments when they're in the cone cells. There are other uh, SNPs that also affect, for example, the optical density of how much pigment occupies a cell, and that will also affect perception and can be an alternative route to having a different phenotype. But I'm going to just focus on uh, one of those uh, locations, just to keep it simple today. We can measure and assess and evaluate all of these locations, but I'm going to focus on this serine to alanine substitution at codon 180 in the exon 3 because it is a more commonly occurring variant that we know if it affects color perception and it's been demonstrated by lab, my lab and other labs. So we do simplify uh, in some of our analyses and today and focus on this one SNP variant, the, the X-linked codon 180 um, uh, l opsin gene variant. And what we do is we sequence all the all the opsin genes that, that uh, we can, we sequence the, the S cone and the M cone and the L cone and rhodopsin, which is a non-trivial task. I won't go into it, but it's not an easy thing to do. And uh, we find subjects who have uh, one allele at the codon 180 site, and those are homozygous for the L opsin, which means they'll only express one type of L opsin in their retina. And then there are other female individuals who have two types of alleles, one on each X chromosome that they inherit, and this person is heterozygous for an L opsin, which means that she'll be an obligate expressor in her phenotype of both types of these L opsin genes. So the underlying cone fundamentals of these two different individuals will be a standard normal trichromat type of model versus this model here that is presumed to be a tetrachromat processing fundamental. I say presumed because it's not always the case that if you possess the genes for having the extra pigment, you end up looking behaviorally like you have a perceptual difference. The reasons for that are complicated. I can't really go into them today, but we have found ways of assessing and measuring when it is the case that individuals do have a functional fourth photopigment class. So uh, color perception research, not just mine, but others, has established that females with two variants of X-linked uh, L180 conopsins are potential tetrachromats who have four receptor classes phenotypically expressed. And some of these potential tetrachromat individuals exhibit color perception that suggests possession of a fourth functioning photoreceptor class, which is the important emphasis, functioning. This raises the interesting empirical question, uh, is color experience significantly different for individuals with more than three photopigment classes? In significantly different, we mean not in a deficient way, but in a way that makes them somehow a better color observer, presumably. We focused on this particular question since 1998 uh, in my lab, and, um, and uh, we've focused in particular on this uh, codon 180 serine alanine polymorphism. Uh, just to give you a feel for the kinds of psychophysical studies we've done and how they relate to uh, the demonstration of a functional tetrachromat difference, let's just look at this one study where we uh, took uh, photographic images, uh, which we used a, an algorithm that was empirically based on data that was collected from tetrachromats, and compared it to processing of this kind of image by a trichromat. 
And what we do is we developed an empirically based filter by which we can take this kind of photographic image or any photographic image and do a pixel by pixel analysis of this photo to understand how perception of each of these pixels may differ when a tetrachromat is observing it in a non-trichromatic way. So we have a baseline processing model that we use to say how a trichromat processes this and how their, their cells and their retina respond to this image. And then we have a tetrachromat model and we look at the difference. And what we do is we, to convey, because we can't really convey to non-trichromats what the fourth signal might look like in your eye, we try to convey with a heat map type of image uh, where the different pixels matter the most to a tetrachromat observer. So in this particular sunset image, we note that 66% of the image pixels did differ for a tetrachromat observer compared to a trichromat control, and they differed in the following way. The white pixels were seen the same as a trichromat observer and a tetrachromat observer. The blue pixels encode where a tetrachromat perception is weaker than a trichromat, and the red pixels encode where a stronger tetrachromat perception is perceived by uh, uh, relative to a trichromat. So with this type of procedure, we can do lots of scene analyses, and not all photos come out the same. Bowls of fruit look different from sunsets, but the interesting thing is we can start to get a qualitative feel of how uh, tetrachromos tetrachromacy in the retina uh, makes a difference in terms of perceptual processing, and it does make a difference. We've used other techniques, which I won't go into, but I'll just say we have reverse engineered uh, potential tetrachromat comb basis function using machine learning types of approaches and shown that they do differ from trichromat uh, basis functions. And we have tested different illumination conditions to evaluate how different matching errors occur based upon uh, model predictions of photopigment ops and genotype. Uh, this, is, this is information that's uh, currently under review at a journal, but it's also a poster that's going to be presented out here in the Fourier by Kirby Joe, and I encourage you to go by and look at it and talk to her about it. Now, unfortunately, as, intu as intuitive and um, compelling the results of the psychophysical methods are, they don't really translate over into clinical, clinical use and clinical applications. So the question is, what color vision assessment approaches can be combined with ops and genotyping and have some potential as a clinical diagnostic? And I just want to briefly touch on two possibilities of what might work. These are possibilities that have been developed in the last couple years uh, under collaboration with people in my lab as well as uh, Chris Kitty and Andrew Brown. And the first one is, is, has to do with establishing comb contrast thresholds with a new device that has been uh, developed recently uh, by Conan Medical, which uh, Andrew Brown and I uh, were able to uh, wrangle a few of these devices and bring them into our labs and our clinics to test subjects with. So what a comb contrast threshold simply is, is um, the point in the visual, visual processing where the difference between a chromatic stimulus and some background, or some, in this case, a neutral gray, can be detected based upon the contrast of the color content in the stimulus. So if you have a, a display like this that you're showing subjects, and this is a mock-up, this is not how it really works, the subject's task would be to look at this, this sort of circle with this gap and press the arrow on the keypad that corresponds to the gap location in the stimulus. So it's a rather straightforward, easy task compared to what uh, might be done by the subjects in my psychophysics lab. And uh, of course, Kona Medical was smart, and they said, well, let's do this for all the different cone classes. And so what you have is uh, you have this task where you have the subject press the arrow, arrow key for a high contrast stimulus. That is, you can clearly see the gap here, and the correct answer is they press the top button. Or you have a low contrast stimulus where the subject's task is to press this bottom button. It may be harder to see this one. But this is the task. It's very simple, very intuitive. And even low vision subjects can do it and, uh, and uh, impaired elderly populations. So it makes for a good uh, type of uh, procedure using in uh, clinical settings. From uh, this kind of data, which is, you know, it's actually not very many trials that you have to run to get these cone contrast threshold uh, uh, estimates because of the a Bayesian algorithm they use to, to uh, estimate uh, the actual thresholds. You can look at individual subjects' data and track it over time and understand how their cone contrast thresholds are changing as a function of disease or just, um, you know, in the case of this tetrachromat, potential tetrachromat subject, as a function of their different cone classes. And uh, so this histogram shows us 
the cone contrast threshold for the L cone class, the M clone class, and the S cone class, and it it shows it relative to a pass-fail line, which is right here at 75, which is used by the United States Air Force uh, as a criterion to admit pilots into a training school. And uh, we can evaluate uh, uh, where our subjects occur in terms of their performance relative to normative populations. We can see that there's this gray region that this, proce this procedure newly allows us to, to probe for very low contrast stimuli that permits the assessment of the range of visual capabilities that are beyond sort of like really good normal visual processing. So we have the ability to detect normal ranges, which are between these yellow bars, <coughs> potentially defective ranges, which are between these bars, and a deficiency range, which is below the blue bar. So the advantage of this type of technique is it's easy, straightforward, and it allows comparison to uh, different types of standard observers and norms, but it also allows us to look possibly at variation that occurs as a function of the underlying genotype that these subjects possess. Because here's an example of the cone contrast threshold for this L cone heterozygous female, and it turns out that she is 25% more sensitive than those typical for age-matched uh, contr uh, control trichromats. And in particular, she does exceptionally well for the L cone mechanism, which is the one where she has the mutation or the extra cone class in her retina. So it seems suggestive, at least, that these types of associations between genotyping and a behavioral index like this, that is rather straightforward to use, can help us understand uh, what's going on uh, in the relationship between the underlying ops and gene sequences and behavior. So in summary, these cone contrast thresholds may correlate with certain types of ops and SNPs. This is preliminary work. The, the jury's still out, but we have good indication that it may. And this task is relatively easy and may be appropriate for use in clinical settings on impaired vision populations. A second example that I want to quickly go through is, uh, has to do with an applied problem. We know the differences in lighting change the colors that we perceive. Here we have a bowl of fruit under an LED light bulb, incandescent bulb. Everybody has experienced this as lighting in their home. This is an important applied problem for the uh, International Commission on Illumination um, because uh, for energy con conservation, it's good to make an LED bulb that color matches light from an incandescent bulb because people love incandescent light. They want it, and people will go out and try to find incandescent bulbs because they don't like LED bulbs and the color rendering that you get under LED bulbs. The question that the CIE is interested in is, yes, we do get energy savings and reduced uh, environmental footprint from these kinds of LED bulbs, but do these kinds of LED lighting situations actually approximate uh, incandescent in a way that provides good color fidelity across all observer phenotypes? We can uh, study that if we know the energy distributions from the two different illuminants, so we see the the color matched LED approximate as the blue line uses a lot less energy in the long wavelength end of the spectrum and we see the incandescent as the red line. And we know that energy distributions of these two color matched light sources will interact differently with different observer phenotypes, especially if the observers have additional sensitivity for longer wavelengths. So in this case, with the presumed tetrachromat fundamentals and the trichromat fundamentals, we know that varied color vision systems will process these two spectra very differently. The tetrachromat will get a much stronger signal, signal than the trichromatic cone <coughs> fundamentals. We did experiments on this kind of question using a programmable light source to establish minimized flicker thresholds in observers that we had genotyped. And uh, my two colleagues over at IBS have, um, have sort of um, tamed this digital micromere device, which is not an easy thing to do. And what we do is we look at um, psychophysically, whether um, when we present participants many stimulus staircases to establish luminance and temporal frequency ranges at which sequential presentation of these color match lights are found to flicker, and we compare those types of results across two phenotype groups, namely genotype uh, trichromats and potential tetrachromats, we look to see whether or not there are any perceptual differences in groups uh, that are, have different underlying genotypes. And the finding that we have is that, in general, female trichromats do not detect any lighting variation when color-matched LEDs and incandescent lights are presented. 
as a flicker stimulus, and a female tetrachromat does detect the variation. So some individuals may not like LED approximates of incandescent as much as other individuals. It's a non-uniform standard at this point. The CIE is interested in changing those profiles of wavelength distribution to get it to work as well for everybody. Now, these results are preliminary, but they are consistent with what we would, would be expected if varied interactions occurred between different observer phenotypes and these uh, color-matched energy distributions. Okay, so to summarize, this idea of minimized flicker thresholds has potential clinical utility and may be appropriate to evaluate whether patients' color perception occurs with underlying ops and genotyping results. And this is the kind of uh, method that we're interested in uh, simplifying and porting over to, uh, to a procedure which would work in the clinical setting. So two candidates for possible uh, translational tools to investigate color in the clinic. Both a color DX and minimized flicker thresholds seem like good prospects for doing that. Lastly, I want to talk about some correlational um, statistical analyses that have been done recently uh, with a database that has been collected by uh, Chris Kinney, Sherry Adelano, and myself um, using Chris Kinney's uh, AMD population, clinical populations. So what we're interested in is investigating the relationship between X-linked oxygen gene SNPs and AMD risk and progression. And that's the, the larger uh, idea behind the project. And so what we did is we took a, a relatively small sample of 135 participants, 67 of which were AMD. The rest were normal age-matched uh, controls. And we did full oxygen genotyping on this sample. And, uh, the AMD group included uh, both wet and dry types of AMD, and the analyses we used were binary log logistic regression with factors that represented age, sex, and five of the relevant photopigment ops and SNP sites that we know affect behavior. The question that we ask is, there an observed association between an AMD diagnosis and the perception of photopigment ops and gene SNPs? I'm gonna touch uh, a little bit later about why we think that's a reasonable question, but just to answer the question outright and quickly, what we find is that in this data we analyze the observed frequency of occurrence of ops and SNPs is greater for our AMD group compared to our age match normal controls. And this is a rather statistically robust finding that we have. So our preliminary uh, statistical investigation suggests an observed association between AMD and photopigment uh, SNPs that are known to impact uh, retina phenotype and perception. Uh, what we plan to do in the future is some further analyses to increase sample sizes of both normal and clinical populations and to separate out in our groups with these larger populations wet from dry AMD and the different severity levels, and that's work that's in progress, and I'm excited to be doing. So uh, just to tie it up, uh, why would we even suspect that color needed to be studied in AMD that uh, there should be a relationship between uh, uh, degenerative diseases of the retinal pigment epithelium like AMD and photopigmentopsin genetics and color perception. Well, there are a few reasons. Um, we, have a, we have a little theory, a toy theory about why it is the case, which is a biochemical theory, but it's not ready for prime time yet. But the, sort of the practical intuitive reasons are the following. Uh, it turns out that the population that is most likely to possess the photopigment ops and SNPs of interest that I've discussed today is also known to be at greater risk for AMD. So these are individuals that come from Indo-European backgrounds and have certain uh, racial ancestry. It turns out that the focal region of AMD deterioration is the region of the retina where X-linked photoreceptors are most dense. And so it makes sense that uh, where you have these mutations occurring most densely, uh, it could be implicated in uh, the act of progressive age-related deterioration. The statistics I showed you, uh, our preliminary analyses, uh, suggest an association between photopigment ops and gene sequences that are known to influence perception and AMD risk and progression. Actually, I didn't show you the risk and progression part. I just showed you that there was an association between possessing AMD and uh, possessing photopigment mutations. 
And lastly, uh, photopigment opsin genotyping seems promising since the literature shows relationships exist between opsin gene mutations, retinal structure, and processes underlying the retinal pigment epithelium diseases that involve progressive de degeneration similar to AMD. So these are the reasons why we suspect there should be a relationship between AMD. This is not um, a widely investigated uh, idea, although recently in the last year in the literature, it's become more of, an, of an, a subject of interest, and uh, we're excited to be involved in that. So just summing up what I talked about today, uh, since 2015, we've been working to establish methods to genotype and psychophysically access individual variations associated with AMD risk in healthy control participants before the disease has begun to develop, and we have generalized those methods to look actually at AMD populations as well. We have novel preliminary results that suggest our genotyping procedures may have a place in the early detection toolbox for patients at risk for AMD. This is not to say that color vision perception and genotyping would take place of any of the existing tools that are in place for AMD uh, analysis and diagnosis and treatment, but it is to say that we may be able to have a a practical behavioral procedure that will detect early on before the disease progresses uh, whether or not someone is likely to develop the disease. Thirdly, we have developed methods to assess perception of participants with known opsin gene variations, and we're working to refine our behavioral assessments to make them appropriate for clinical populations. And through opsin genotyping, we hope to deliver innovative early diagnostic system assessment tools for aiding patients who experience progressive visual diseases that can result in blindness. With that, I'd like to thank you for listening and also acknowledge my project collaborators in this work. Um, uh, the main work on the genotyping and genetics has been done by Sherry Adelano and Chris Kinney. Kirby Joe is a graduate student over in the Institute for Math and Behavioral Sciences. Her and Tim Sadlich, who's on the faculty, uh, have also uh, worked very uh, intensely on doing the modeling and the empirical studies on the psychophysical side. My uh, colleague in Finland, Vladimir Bochko, has worked on the genetic algorithms as well as the machine learning approaches with me uh, to analyze the data that we've collected. And recently, Adriana Briscoe from the Department of Equal Evo here on main campus has uh, been working with Chris Kenny and Sherry and I to extend uh, the ideas of our ops and genotyping beyond uh, into the non-human primate literature and beyond. So uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. We, we run a um, empirical study before the algorithm is developed. It's an it's a empirical study that decides what the minimum motion thresholds are for perceiving um, color in a stimulus. So it's a, it's a particular paper that was uh, published by uh, Ali Winkler and Keith Goldfarb and me. And uh, we have this empirical data as our basis for understanding what colors in the color space the different phenotypes uh, perceive at different levels. So you can think of it in the following way. Um, maybe you're a color deficient dichromat who doesn't have a medium wavelength cone. Your, your ability to detect greens is going to be really low and your, your, your threshold for that is going to be really low. So we collect a lot of data for detection of green in computer driven displays, detection of red, detection of blue, and so on. And then we de devise, based on that data, a filter for that dichromat. We also do the same thing for a trichromat. We do the same thing for a potential tetrachromat. And in the filtered image that I showed you, what we did is we basically took uh, the heat mapped version of that picture, pixel by pixel, to say how different is the perception of the trichromat, given what we've observed empirically in other experiments, from that which we observe for a potential tetrachromat. And we basically just said, pixel by pixel comparison, this pixel for the tetrachromat is greater in terms of its ability to be detected compared to some other pixel of a trichromat.
So we don't expect it to be the case that if you have an extra photopigment class in your retina, that's going to necessarily bang out a whole other dimension of color experience. What we expect and what we've seen in our, in our data is that it increases the ability for individuals to do detection in the region where the extra photopigment class uh, is maximally absorbed in the wavelength. So if you think about those pictures of, of a potential tetrachromat processing model, the extra photopigment was intermediate to the M cone and the L cone. So it was sort of like an orangey range if you want to give it a color description. So the idea would be if you have an extra cone in that area, that is the region of the spectrum which you are going to be at an advantage of processing. Just like if you drop a cone out from a dichromat, you're not going to be able to process as well as that re in that region. So <clears throat> we did find that not all levels of uh, this particular tetrachromat's processing was up to par with a standard normal trichromat. In particular, in the bluish regions, this individual didn't do as well uh, as, as, uh, uh, as um, our standard normal trichromat model. So it may be the case, and this is something that we, we are factoring into our analysis methods, that things like age and lens yellowing could affect the filtering and the perception in those particular regions of the spectrum. And uh, these are factors that we folded into our model and are in the process of looking at. And it's front end processing differences like that that may matter in the, in the, in the development of these algorithms. So in the future, we hope to be able to incorporate those in our estimation procedures as well. So there's a whole lot of different options in the human body, right? There's parapanopsin, melanopsin, all these other things. And, and obviously, those may affect um, perception at some level. But the question is, what are the major um, types of options that are in the, the back level of the retina that, and that handle visual processing. And as theory goes, um, you've got you know, um, the X-linked ones, at chromosome three and chromosome seven, and, and uh, you know, rhodopsin in the S-cone, and, and these are the ones that are of main interest. Um, to the degree that the models don't fit, it does beg your question, are there any other contributors to this phenomenon that I'm not, I'm not catching? And uh, so I just have to say, in defense of this work, that um, um, looking at the relationship between opsin genetics and perception is, is sort, of a, it's a, sort of a hard thing to do. It's easy to do when you're looking at dichromats, because that's a cut and dried. Color deficiency is a cut and dried, easy, relatively easy to look at type of uh, relationship between phenotype and genotype. But as you get over to <clears throat> genes for multiple variants of these cone classes, uh, the actual expression and uh, whether or not the populations of cone classes are sufficient enough to hold up a different, you know, a different signal, and all these other factors come to play. And uh, so th this is ongoing, and I, I, think, I think a full understanding of it will be clearer in the future. But thank you very much for your question. I appreciate it.